Welcome to Little Wars TV. I'm Greg, and this week I will be the host and war game referee for one of my favorite American Civil War battles, the Battle of Antietam. In this episode, I'll be joined by Keith, our club's resident history professor. Together, we'll visit the battlefield to review the background of the Maryland campaign and settle our own historical disagreement over just how badly George McClellan bungled Antietam. Finally, we'll pick teams for the war game and refight the battle on this tabletop. And for the losers, there will be consequences. Now let's go rewrite history. No need for green screen or any VFX tricks, we've taken a road trip to Sharpsburg, Maryland. Hi, I'm Greg, and I used to work for the National Park Service at Gettysburg Battlefield. And like Gettysburg, Antietam is one of the best preserved battlefields in the United States, or anywhere in the world for that matter. I came out here with Keith today to get the lay of the land and talk a little bit about the context of this campaign. Hi, I'm Keith. I've been a history professor for 10 years and a wargamer for 30. So he teaches history, and I just wish I did. It doesn't pay as well as you think. Well, let's talk Antietam. One of the reasons I think this battle is so fascinating is that the American Civil War really could have ended right here in September 1862, instead of dragging on for three more years. In the summer of 1862, some kind of Southern victory in the Civil War felt like a very real possibility. Within the span of just two months, Robert E. Lee managed to save Richmond from McClellan and crush a second Northern Army under Pope in the Battle of Second Manassas. Farther west, a major Confederate invasion of Kentucky was underway. The political and military pressure against President Lincoln back in Washington was growing downright poisonous, and there were leaders in London and Paris seriously discussing the prospect of recognizing the Confederacy with a negotiated American ceasefire. While the momentum of the war may have felt like it was moving in Lee's favor, his invasion of Maryland was a dangerous gamble. Lincoln had just handed McClellan total control over an army more than double the size of the rebel force. Morale in the federal ranks soared while Little Mac was back in control, and through some unbelievable luck we'll discuss in a minute, McClellan actually managed to outmaneuver Lee and corner the Confederates with their backs to the Potomac. Lee had recklessly risked everything on this campaign and now found himself on the verge of disaster. Very true, a major Union victory at Antietam could have trapped and completely destroyed Lee's army. And McClellan f***ed it all up. Maybe. That is the popular narrative. But I think if we unpack that history a little bit, we'll find it's a bit more complicated. And the best place to start isn't here at this battlefield, it's a much less famous battlefield, 25 miles that way. Where are we going? Where it all started. Fort Sumter? Smart ass. Back in college, I spent a summer interning here at Monocacy, a small battlefield outside of Frederick, Maryland. Just four days before the battle, something incredible happened right here at this ordinary farm called the Best Farm. This is where Special Order 191 was found, and its discovery changed the course of the entire campaign. Now, I don't know that it necessarily happened right here, but the story of the Lost Order is pretty famous. Union soldiers found some orders wrapped around cigars, and it detailed Lee's plan for the campaign. Now, during the invasion of Maryland, Lee boldly divided his smaller army into five smaller parts. Three columns to capture Harper's Ferry, an advance column to Boonesboro, and a rear guard at South Mountain. When McClellan got his hands on Lee's plans, he wired Washington, I have all the plans of the rebels and will catch them in their own trap. We'll send you trophies. Now, that is some typical McClellan bluster, followed by typical McClellan in action. He lost an entire day sitting around at Frederick, which gave Lee an opportunity to regroup his forces at Antietam. That is the popular knock against McClellan for this campaign, but during the summer that I spent working for the Park Service here at Monocacy, I learned there might be a little bit more to that story. I think that the McClellan haters are guilty of some armchair generalship and 2020 hindsight. A lot of people do like to criticize McClellan for his handling of the Lost Orders, that's true. But remember, the timing of when he received them and how long it took to devise his response is still hotly debated. The debate among historians centers around a famous telegram McClellan wired to Lincoln on September 13th, boasting that no time shall be lost and his army was in motion as rapidly as possible. This telegram was timestamped 12M, which most historians assumed meant meridian, or 12 noon. But more recent evidence from the Library of Congress and the Lincoln Papers confirms that McClellan did not send that telegram until 12 midnight which lines up with the timing of when he wired Halleck and his corps commanders that evening. 
What does all of this mean and why am I going into such detail? Because the timing of events matters, and it confirms that McClellan did not sit on his hands for 18 critical hours as historians have long alleged. There are many ways that we could criticize McClellan as a general, but his response to Lee's lost orders may not be one of them. And if you don't want to take my word for it, take Stonewall Jackson's. In the midst of the campaign, Jackson was stunned to learn of McClellan's sudden aggressiveness. He wrote to Lee, I thought I knew McClellan, but this movement of his puzzles me. Even if that's the case, and maybe McClellan's handling of the campaign isn't as bad as I thought, you gotta admit, his handling of the battle itself was awful. <laughs> it really was. It was awful. We'll agree on that. Okay. Well, let's head back to Antietam and uh, see where it all went wrong for McClellan. I didn't know you were a little Mac apologist. I'm not, I swear. I really hope those soldiers got to keep some cigars. Now, Lee chose this creek as his defensive line on September 15th. It was a fairly strong position, but he had under 20,000 men that day. Most of his army was still arriving from Harper's Ferry. Well, since we're gonna be creating a miniature replica for our war game of the battlefield, what are some of the key terrain features that will demonstrate Lee's powerful defensive position? Well, this, this creek behind us is an obvious place to start. Uh, it's not particularly wide or deep, but it can be forded at several points by infantry, not by artillery or wagons. Lee was set up on a low ridge line, running north to south, and that is also an important feature. Again, not really much of a hill, though. But it's important for line of sight. It's a really good artillery position. As you can see, the area is dotted with stone walls, fences, and little slopes that would be perfect for a defensive battle and Lee would need all the help he could get that day. McClellan's plan was to overwhelm Lee's left while launching diversionary attacks in the center and right, but McClellan briefed each of his corps commanders separately without allowing them to coordinate or understand their roles in the larger battle. It was a colossal command and control failure. Now I'm the Union player, and I don't intend to make the same mistakes. As the war game referee, I do have a couple of fog of war ideas that might hamper your plans just a little bit. Speaking of which, it's probably time to leave the park go back, pick teams for our war game, and talk a little bit about the rules that we're going to use to refight the battle. And if you're not ready to leave the park quite yet, check out our extended Antietam Battlefield Tour bonus video next week. It's a much deeper dive into the battle. But for now, we have a war game to set up. I'm ready to kill some secesh. On the tabletop at 6 a.m. on September 17, 1862, a wet, foggy morning, the bloodiest day in American history is about to begin, but will our players be able to rewrite the outcome? So, how was the battlefield visit? That was great. I managed to convince Greg here that uh, McClellan was an egotistical ass. That really was never in doubt. Um, so I think the four of you are going to be our players for Antietam. We will be fighting to preserve the Union. And we will be proving once and for all that McClellan should have won this battle. We're fighting to defend our southern honor, sir. We have the right to govern ourselves. To play this scenario, we are going to be using the best set of American Civil War rules ever written, Altar of Freedom. <laughs> part out later. In, in fairness, I did write and design the rules several years ago, so somebody else probably should be giving an honest review. Now, who's, who's doing this? Somebody be nice. I was one of the original play testers, so I'm already biased. Uh, I was too. Damn it. Can we at least get a man with some Civil War facial hair to give this review? Hi, I'm Woody. I don't even find the American Civil War that interesting, but I guess I can do this. Alter of Freedom is a set of rules for grand tactical battles in the Civil War. It's designed for fast playing, large scale battles. Is that good? A bit short, but we should probably cut off this discussion before somebody else insults my rules. Uh, for those interested, check back next week for a bonus video where we're going to dig a lot deeper into the mechanics and, and give an honest review of Alter of Freedom. All right, so I have been thinking for the last week about what needs to be at stake for the winners and losers of this battle. So, isn't Southern honor enough? And I think maybe shame is a more powerful motivator. So I'm proposing that the losers of this game will have to uh, grow out and wear Civil War facial hair, but no shaving for at least a week. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Before we get started, uh, a quick briefing for what's going on here in the game and the objectives. Uh, Federal Army. You guys have two ways that you can win this battle. You can break the Confederate Army, or at any point you can end the turn uh, holding Lee's line of the retreat back to the Potomac. Uh, Confederate players, you guys really only have one way to win this. This is strictly survival. If you can end the day still on the field, you've held on 
for a tactical victory. Survival? What if we break the army of those people and drive them from the field? I, I admire that confidence, Mars Robert, um, but you know, you've only got maybe 40,000 troops here at the battle. Not all of them even start on the battlefield in the morning. Uh, and the Union Army is, is closer to 80,000. Now, are we going to follow a historical setup, or can we deploy anywhere we want? We're, we're going to do a mostly historical setup for this battle, uh, but I do have a twist. Um, part of the reason McClellan acted so cautiously the couple of days before this battle was fog of war. Um, and there was also an actual fog on the battlefield the morning of the 17th. So uh, we're going to do hidden deployment, and for the first couple of turns we'll be moving without miniatures on the table. We're only going to put them on the table as they're spotted and revealed. So um, that's it for the briefing. I'll let you guys break into your teams to discuss strategy. The Army of Northern Virginia is organized into two corps. It's 39 brigades, approximately 200 pieces of artillery. As you can see, the miniatures are quite small. These are six millimeter miniatures. Each of these stands represents an entire brigade. Now at Antietam, the average brigade is about 1,100 men, but most of the Confederate formations were severely under strength. I think our plan here today is to fight a delaying action at the southern end of the field and look for an opportunity to counterattack at the northern end. I agree. What we have here is the Army of the Potomac at the Battle of Antietam. It's 80,000 men strong, organized into six corps, plus a small cavalry reserve. Okay, so McClellan lost the battle because he was unable to coordinate, and he went for a strong right hook, and it didn't work. What are we going to do differently? Well, what we're going to be able to do is a double envelopment, and the reason it's going to work is because unlike the real commanders, you and I are actually going to be able to coordinate this attack. Because all of the miniatures start the game off the tabletop, only I can see both deployments as the referee. It looks like Chow and Keith are closely following McClellan's historical deployment with a few minor adjustments. Over on the Confederate side, Tony and Zach look to have made a more radical departure, pushing Longstreet's corps far forward to contest the creek crossings, with Jackson hanging back much farther than he did historically. We'll see how that plays out. Our battle begins at 6 a.m., with Franklin's corps emerging from the fog to launch an immediate attack against the lower bridge. As miniatures are placed on the table, the Federals find the creek crossing defended in strength by Longstreet, sparking a furious fight in the fog with limited visibility. So the big shocker, 6 a.m., we cross the bridge. We push the Confederates back, and now we've got to hold it. It's surprising for the number of Confederate troops trying to hold the bridge crossing are so weak. They're extremely weak brigades. Uh, I'm having trouble coordinating a massive attack, but I am very pleased to have been able to cross and put troops on the right side of the Antietam Creek. The battle for what was known as Burnside's Bridge is now being written as Franklin's Bridge. For two hours, the fighting rages along the creek, which changes hands four times. At 9 a.m., Longstreet commits one of his few reserves, McClaw's division, to finally reassert control over the crossing. With the morning fog burning off by 10 a.m., McClellan sends forward Edwin Sumner's corps from their position at the Pry House. Sumner finds quick success in securing the middle bridge, but once again a swift Confederate counterthrust plugs the gap as the Federal numbers are neutralized by the narrow crossing points. With no fighting on his end of the field and no Yankees in sight, Zack spends his morning attending to cotton gun smoke effects on the table. Nobody does cotton quite like Zack, who takes his title as our club's official cottonsman pretty seriously. It's been a busy morning for Lee and Longstreet, but from his headquarters at Dunker Church, Stonewall Jackson is beginning to wonder where the rest of the Federal Army might be. See how long you can choke them up with that river crossing. And, so uh, I will hold them off all day. <laughs> I hope by God that you do. And, uh, and you know, any, any time now I'm expecting uh, just uh, a whole army of Yankees to come down those northern roads, and I have no clue where they are, and I'm just waiting to have my troops uh, spring out and ambush them. Lee and Jackson are right to be worried about the missing elements of the Army of the Potomac, but have done little to find them. Lee holds Stuart's cavalry back in Sharpsburg, and Jackson adopts a very rearward defense with no advance pickets. This mistake would soon manifest itself in spectacular fashion, as two full Federal Corps spend the morning hours marching on a wide flanking effort undetected. 
As the morning passes without contact, even General Hooker begins to wonder when his right hook would meet some rebel resistance. I am the right hook um, of the pincer. Uh, I'm, we're moving and we've gotten really far uh, into position where we want to be, but we don't see any enemy, I don't know what's going on. So I'm confident with the hook, but I'm getting nervous, but we don't know what's out there. At noon, the Federal right hook finds what's out there. It's two small divisions under Jackson, who thought they were laying in ambush, but now find themselves hopelessly outnumbered by the oncoming Federal wave. So <laughs> it, it worked. Uh, we've, our, right, our strong right hook, which had been moving without opposition, finally came into contact, and we were coming down the Hagerstown Pike, and they had woods on either side, and they parked a division in each side of the road, and we just punched right through down, through the middle, ran the gap, ran down the road. This is a pivotal moment in the battle, when the Confederate Army is about to be overrun. Lee and Jackson make a desperate decision to take their only reserve, D.H. Hill's division, and abandon the sunken road to about face and meet Hooker's attack. To Union Corps, I have no choice but to devote all my points, all my, uh, my focus, and bring the, uh, the center of my line into response, stop them from taking my headquarters. Do you want, do you want me to, to do an assault and flank them? Yeah, yeah, let's hit them. Um, you gotta stabilize this line anyhow, so let's try and hit. I can just go You gotta right watch here. this artillery as an issue. Yeah. Um, but let's try and hit this division here, drive them off. Okay. We don't think that we can actually take the road at this point. We don't think we have not, enough strength. Not with these troops. There's too many troops over there. However, we want to f mess with um, the Confederates. We're going to throw Pleasanton's Cavalry Corps up this probably undefended road. Because he'll just, vacated. And just see if they panic. If they panic, we might have an opportunity to slip something through. We have an enormous problem in our center. Um, the Union has done something uh, unprecedented, unthinkable. There's a cavalry division, an entire cavalry division, launching an attack across the open ground towards the sunken road, which we've just vacated. Boy, it's too bad nobody's defending that sunken lane. <laughs> Where did they all go? Where did they all go? This has potential to be devastating to, to our lines here. Um, we've we've got to find some reserves that we can shift to shore that up. It's 3 p.m. and Lee makes his second all-or-nothing gamble of the afternoon. With only Hood's small division left to defend the Confederate line of retreat to the Potomac, Lee orders D.H. Hill to about face again, countermarching back to Dunker Church to meet the Federal cavalry charge in the center. With Jackson's line being caved in from two directions, McClellan can sense a complete victory may be within reach. But at this critical moment in the late afternoon, A.P. Hill's veteran division appears on the horizon from their 17-mile forced march. As happened historically, A.P. Hill provides Lee with that last counterpunch he needs to stave off a total collapse. But in our game, Hill doesn't slam into Burnside's line. He slams into Hooker and Mansfield, ending their threat to upend the rebel flank. So close, yet so far away. Okay, the good side, we, we came up with a plan. The offensive on the right hook, it worked really well it worked really well we got up right into the rebel rear we yeah came that close we were that we were inches away and then and then it fell apart but uh, to give some credit miles. the confederates they responded to an unexpected uh, assault something they obviously didn't intend to happen yeah and they were able to put up a defense uh, pretty rapidly and some hard fighting but we really really mixed them up <laughs> yes we did no matter what we threw them into uh, confusion I feel good about it. Good work. Holy smokes. Yeah, that was definitely nerve-wracking. Um, the Union launches a core plus worth of troops out of out of thin air into them. And the, those two small divisions I had waiting to ambush them uh, from their picnic were entirely insufficient to stop that. It turned into a massive breakthrough and very nearly a rout. We made a decision that the game was likely lost and we would throw everything we had at them in an attempt to stop it. And if it worked, great, we turn everybody to face the next threat. And if it doesn't work, we just are slaughtered. It was a nail-biter to the end. 
uh, just you know, when AP Hill lollygags his way into shore up our line. It was a great game, it was a nail biter the whole way through it. Um, couldn't have asked for better opponents than Chow and Keith. I'm just glad I got to be a part of it. Same here. It was looking pretty grim for the Confederates, but they pulled out a really narrow victory. I had a great time refereeing this game. It was a blast. And even though our battle played out in a completely different fashion from the historical engagement, the final result was essentially the same, a desperate defensive effort by Lee. I think the scenario was a tale of some missed opportunities for Chow and Keith. I would credit them with playing a really great battle in the morning, where they were successful at coordinating multiple parts of a large, cumbersome army, the Army of the Potomac. But that kind of fell apart for them in the afternoon. When victory was so close at hand, they got tunnel vision, and they spent too much energy micromanaging Hooker's flank attack, and I think it cost them the battle. I think they lost sight of the rest of the battlefield, where a lot of the fighting essentially had flamed out by the afternoon. So that means that there's just one last bit of business for our players. The Union Beard has arrived! No way, man. Fake beard? I've seen better beards at a sideshow. <laughs> Loser! <laughs> Alright, let's do this. Ah, so now it's a Civil War beard. Ah. Huh? Ah. Join us next week for another episode of Little Wars TV.